Hello, this is the GI Show. I'm Dr. Chris Shaver, and we appreciate you joining us here for our first show ever. Uh, we are here in Birmingham, Alabama at the lovely BGA Studios here in Birmingham. And our mission really is simple. It's to educate and empower patients. Patients that we see, patients with gastrointestinal illnesses, um, patients with liver disease, um, and just really helping and educating and hopefully inspiring you. Disclaimer alert, this is not, shouldn't be considered official medical advice. This is gonna be my opinion. We're gonna have a lot of really great guests and it will be their opinions these are expert opinions, uh, but, um, but really official medical advice is really reserved for that physician-patient relationship in the doctor's office. We're here at BGA Studios, Birmingham Gastroenterology sponsors this show, so we want to hype them up. They can be looked at online at bgapc.com, so we'd encourage you to check out the BGA website. Um, uh, I am a physician that works at BGA, and so uh, that website has a lot of good content, and it's going to be new content on our blog every few weeks, so check that out. We've got a special guest today, um, and we're going to be talking about the liver, so I want to invite Dr. David Fettig to join me. Uh, come on, Dr. Fettig. Thank you. So uh, good to see you. You too. Glad All right, glad to be here. I'm glad you're here. Um, so, Dr. Fedig is uh, a gastroenterologist who is, I would consider you a liver guru. I like to be I think it's that. safe to say. Yeah, you liver should. Liver man. And so, um, so basically, David, uh, we're glad you're here. Tell us a little bit about you. Where did you train? So I did, uh, first I did my undergraduate work at Florida State University and my whole family goes there and so that's where I went. And then I went to University of South Florida in Tampa for medical school. And then I came to UAB and that's how I kind of ended up here in Birmingham for, uh, and I knew I always had, kind of really wanted to go to UAB for my training and wanted to stay in the Southeast. And so um, I looked at a couple places and, and UAB was a great fit. So I came there and did my internship residency, chief residency. I uh, did my GI liver fellowship and then I stayed and I was the first uh, liver transplant fellow at, at, uh, at uh, UAB and then now it's a board, of credit, uh, board certification so I did yeah. that. Now I'm here. Why liver? I mean uh, what was like, yeah. so the liver is a really, just so you know, uh, and again this is really for, like we're talking to patients mainly. We may also be talking to some primary care doctors, um, maybe even some GI trainees. Um, and so, so that's kind of, that's who you are out there, but the liver is a really interesting organ and I think it's underrated. Absolutely. Um, obviously you thought, so tell me why, why liver, because it's kind of like a little bit of a cerebral organ. It takes a little extra to understand kind of all the complexities of the liver. So tell me kind of what drew you to it. Well, so first off, I had, um, when I was an intern, um, I was on the service and I worked with now uh, my main mentor, his name is Brendan McGuire. And so I had two really good mentors, Brendan McGuire and Joe Bloomer, and both of them kind of paved the way for really liver disease and, and liver uh, um, uh, you know, care here in Alabama. Mm -hmm. And it's really kind of remarkable. I mean, that could be a whole nother piece, but of what they were, were able to accomplish. And so they really uh, were great mentors to me and, uh, you know, really great influences. And so when I was on that service, I guess the thing that I liked was there was some infectious disease with it. There was rheumatology involved in it. Uh, there was a transplant aspect of it, which I, you know, I've really fallen in love with and really care about. There was critical care patients, but there was also well patients. And there was kind of this vast kind of array of possibilities that you could really focus on. And so when I saw that, and that's kind of what drew me internal medicine, you know, is that you kind of could do everything. And I felt like with that, it really was. And yeah. so, you know, there wasn't just one specific thing, there were multiple things. And so, you know, in order to say, well, why do you like, you know, chocolate ice cream versus strawberry? Well, I don't know, I just do. 
And so for me, that's what it was. And so I tell people all the time when they're in clinic with me, they'll say like, you really get excited over liver disease. I said, I love it. I mean, I really love, I love talking about it. I love reading about it. I love discussing it. I like going to conferences about it. I just really, really love it. You're kind of like a wide receiver who can also like return punts. Like, cause, you, cause Dr. Fettig does general gastroenterology. I mean, that's, so he does, you know, uh, irritable bowel syndrome, reflux, pancreatic disease, does screening colonoscopies, but oh, by the way, he takes care of really incredibly complex liver disease. And so that's like, that's kind of a big deal. So like receiver who returns kicks, that's kind of my analogy. So quick rapid fire, get to know you, Dr. Okay. Fettig. All right, so coolest place you've ever been? Probably when I was younger, we went on a soccer trip. I played soccer growing up and we were in Canada and went to Niagara Falls. And I just thought that was one of the most powerful, like, you know, you see it on TV, but it's another thing to like see it live and up close. It was really powerful. So I haven't traveled a whole lot, really besides going to like Bahamas and Canada, I haven't been outside the United States all that much. So I'd say that's probably one of the coolest things I've ever seen. Favorite movie we should watch. Oh, without a doubt, Miracle. The, the movie about the 1980 yeah. Lake Placid Olympic team, just the best sporting event ever. So Michael sure. Rizzioni. Michael yeah, Rizzioni. Great scene. Bit. Yep. All right. So um, favorite music genre? Uh, probably country. Country. Okay. I didn't know that about you. Yeah. That's cool. I've been. Right. I've seen George Strait five different cities. Oh wow. Yeah. That's cool. Uh, all right, so um, next, we're kind of going to transition to a topic, and we're going to try to keep this light and fun, uh, as fun as you can. Uh, we're going to talk about abnormal liver function tests, and that's important because we see a lot of patients in the hospital and also here in, in the office who are sent to us, and they're told that their liver tests are not normal. And so I wanted just to kind of pose you a few questions about this really common kind of medical issue that we see that involves the liver. Now I will say in most of this is benign disease, but that's kind of why we see them is we need to sort of distinguish what sort of, okay, we can follow this, you're gonna be okay, from what might really be an issue and might represent a problem. But so I wanna kind of get into some questions. First of all, we're just gonna back up and start with some general questions. What in the heck does the liver do? Like so, yeah. I don't want I don't want the, the yeah. necessarily the um, Yamada answer, yeah. but like kind of like generally we have to have the liver, right? Right. So what does it do? So one of the first things I kind of tell people is it is like the first line of defense uh, for your immune system. So hmm. you know when you absorb any medication, food, anything that goes into your intestines. Uh, your liver is kind of that drainage system that the blood goes to that li the liver first before it hits the rest of the body. So it has its own separate drainage system. Um, it's called a portal system. The rest of the system, like stuff that drains the muscles, stuff that drains, um, uh, you know, uh, skin, that sort of stuff, that goes through the cable system. And so that is a separate, totally drainage system. So it will help kind of, and I told people, it's kind of like a filter. I don't like to think of it so much as that, but it kind of does that. It helps with uh, packaging uh, for, uh, you know, like, you know, glucose metabolism and things like that too, that you think about. Mm -hmm. um, it has many different functions, but I think the one of the neat functions it does have is with the immune system and people don't think of the liver in that, that sense, but it really does. Yeah, so filter organ somewhat, um, protein synthesis organ, immune organ, Absolutely. Um, lots of different Look stuff. Look at a standard liver panel. What are, what are we evaluating? What are, what are we getting a sort of a snapshot of when, when yeah. we see that? So when your doctor orders that, uh, it can mean a lot of different things. So typically, and, and here's a kind of a, a, a wrong terminology, and it's actually infiltrated into the medical community, physicians, even in medical school, they'll call it liver function tests. There's nothing functional about the tests that are ordered. They don't say yeah. anything about function to, to the most degree. So, you know, it'll look at, there's two enzymes that are specific uh, that they look at called AST and ALT. Um, they'll look at that. Again, people talk like their liver function test. They don't say anything about function. They don't, 
Mm -hmm. They don't tell you anything about the functionality of the liver. Yeah. Uh, there's another test, bilirubin, that we look at. Again, that helps with uh, fat digestion. And so they'll look at that. Uh, we'll look at albumin. It's a protein your liver makes, one of the biggest proteins, if not the biggest protein in the body. Mm -hmm. um, we'll look at total protein when we look at that. Um, there's another test uh, called alkaline phosphatase. You know, when the liver receives a lot of pressure, let's say from a gallstone being stuck, that number goes up. So um, now a lot of these, a lot of these uh, lab tests are not specific to the liver, but a lot of things can happen. Uh, you know, when the liver has problems, that some of these enzymes um, and proteins are specific to the liver in some sense. Give me a short list of like causes of abnormal. We say abnormal LFTs, abnormal liver enzymes. Mm -hmm. um, quick thing that I experienced was many years ago in my, my 30s, I applied for life insurance and they came to my house and they drew my blood and mm -hmm. I get a letter saying, you know, we really can't give you life insurance unless you can see your doctor and they can explain why your total bilirubin is 2.5. Right. Like this is me. And I'm like, okay, I was a fellow in gastroenterology down in Tampa at the time, so I knew exactly what I had. I was a little surprised, but, and I didn't panic because I knew what it was. And so I did go to a doctor and I got a letter. So, you know, and you know what I had. Yeah. But what are some of the sort of like short list, a couple, three causes of abnormal liver tests? So you can go through like the big ones, right? So everyone thinks of the liver and they think like if it was, if they go to their friend's house and they say, hey, I have liver disease, they say, oh my goodness, they're drinking too much. Yeah. Um, well, that is one, okay? That's not actually becoming one of the number one causes. The number one cause of liver disease rising in the United States, um, and if not the world, but specifically to our region is fatty liver or non-alcoholic liver disease. So then you think of that, you think of all the new uh, hepatitis drugs out there that are curing hepatitis C. Uh, my kind of, if you said, well, what's your favorite thing to take care of? My number one favorite thing to take care of is hepatitis B. Uh, we don't see tons of the United States, but I just love uh, uh, reading about that, knowing about that. So there's viral things. And then there's kind of the ones that are a little more esoteric uh, that are kind of uh, um, autoimmune stuff, uh, autoimmune hepatitis, primary biliary cirrhosis, primary biliary cholangitis, uh, primary, uh, primary sclerosing cholangitis. Um, so there's a lot of other autoimmune stuff. And then there are some other kind of things that are inherited, hemochromatosis, Wilson's disease, some other things. And what did I have? Yeah, Jill Bears. Not it's Gilbert's, not Gilbert's. Jill Bears, like Jill the Bears. French would say, yeah, right? G-I-L-B-E-R-T-S. And I have the same thing and I was denied life insurance. Wow. Yeah. Fist bump on that one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I guess Gilbert was probably the guy, like a great French physician at the turn of the century that first described it. Probably. Very benign. Very benign. Maybe that's the trivial pursuit answer, I don't know. Uh, so let's talk about alcohol. You touched on it briefly. Alcohol in the liver. That's the classic sort of association as alcohol in excess being toxic to the liver. When you think about cirrhosis, you automatically think about someone who drank too much during their lifetime and now they have alcoholic cirrhosis. Is it safe to drink? Um, how much is safe? Um, what are your thoughts on alcohol in the liver? So if you don't have liver disease, okay, you don't have, there's nothing wrong with your liver, your liver is fine. Yeah, there's a safe quantity. Um, what I do is I try to point people to like surgeon general recommendations because I think they're really good. They've changed a little bit. Now there's different consumption recommendations based off male and female gender too. Mm -hmm. I think one of the big things is that, you know, nowadays what's interesting is that all these new microbreweries are popping up all over the United States, right? So if you go to the grocery store, there used to be maybe two or three. Now there's only like Budweiser, Bud Light in this little section. The rest of it's all these places <laughs> from, you know, like right. every possible place in the country, yeah. uh, which is neat. But at the same time, you know, it used to be you could have a you know, two bottles of beer at this quantity of alcohol. We never, it was kind of fixed. Right. That's not the case anymore. And so I think people have to pay attention to that a lot more. And I try to counsel people on that. It's yeah. interesting people coming in talking about it. Um, and then mm -hmm. also too, uh, you know, I call it the self pour technique. So people come in and they're drinking a glass of wine. Well, what does that really mean? Are you really measuring it out? How much is that? You know, and how big is that glass? And so there's a lot of kind of things on, you'll see pictures on the internet that kind of, you know, talk about that and they'll, you know, you know, have, you know, make a joke or two about it. But really in the end of the day, I have to, you, it's a very slippery slope. Um, I don't know that I, you know, because I don't know their history a lot of times and what they're struggling with. So it's not just the drinking, like, yeah. is that going to lead to multiple other issues later on and bad habits? And so 
think you have to be very careful how you answer that. Um, there is a rule of thumb that you kind of, a very crude rule of thumb that you sort of learn as a medical student early on is that when a patient comes in and you ask them as part of your thorough history taking how much they drink per week and they give you their answer let's say it's six beers you automatically double it yeah. because people do tend to underestimate how much they consume of alcoholic beverages so um so but with that being said um defining actually the amount's important because and 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 giving the patient the freedom to to be honest and open about yeah. that so you can really guide them what if someone has chronic liver disease i say no so i really do that's no. that i agree with you on that no that's that's just the default um and because it's just like it's just reasonable to do that it's just safest sure. for the patient and um there's just way more like bad things that can come out of of drinking in the setting of liver disease than good things well, one thing you also too is that when you have that yeah let's say let's give the example you have autoimmune hepatitis and your numbers are getting worse well is it you know i mean hepatitis is because you're drinking too much right. you know and so my my opinion is is like just get get rid of it it's not that important yeah so get rid of it get the one less thing out of the system that's going to affect the functional aspect of your right. liver and the longevity of that liver and the other issue is some people are going to need help not drinking um and and despite warnings they're going to still struggle so identifying the patient that might need a referral to treatment yeah and i do that a lot i mean yeah. that's kind of one of my uh you know real big passions too is that mm -hmm. helping people in the clinic so you know when they come and they are and i can and i know they're struggling with it again you know a lot of my patients would tell you man he really spends a lot of time mm -hmm. discussing aa and discussing yeah. how i can get sober and in, in ways and always ask and very involved and so um there is no you know no they don't have they they and they know too even if they relapse and they continue to drink i'll continue to take care of them mm -hmm. You know, so that I would never not take care of them because they were continuing down that path. I'll just keep encouraging and doing the best we can to That is a that's a great point and something that, that really a, an important message. And I will say, don't you kind of find it ironic that we're right next door to a bar? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, we, yeah. we are and, and yeah, just the irony. So all right, so let's talk a couple more questions, uh, and then we'll kind of wrap this first episode of the GI show up. And by the way, GI show is the only thing after months of thinking about what to name this show, it's the only thing I came up with, which is really sad. So if you guys watching this have an idea for a better name for the GI show, please comment, let me know, um, any kind of comment. But if you want to include on that a better idea for what we should name this, please let me know. All right, so in your opinion, in your expert liver guru opinion, what's the biggest threat to the average U.S. liver at this time? Oh, it's without question, it's going to be fatty liver um, or non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, so NASH. Mm -hmm. So it's 25%, I think it was the last uh, data that I looked at, one in four patients, 25% have fatty liver, not fatty liver with inflammation, which we call NASH, but fatty liver. It's, it's just, it's astronomic. And when you look at the rest of the trends, the obesity trends in the United States, you look at, you know, food consumption and and you know availability of, of good healthy foods and, and one of the things I look at is cost you know I mean cost of cer certain foods is just is kind of absurd and so you know sometimes you know mm -hmm. only options people have are you know yeah. you know fast foods which is unfortunate and so um, we're, we're seeing it in our youth we're seeing fatty liver in our youth uh, we're seeing obviously fatty liver um, in our adult population patients that have bad diabetes metabolic syndrome and we understand that there's some neg uh, genetic components to this as well and so it is a, it's not a somewhat of a threat or is this gonna be a problem? It's a major problem now and it's continuing to rise. And you look at the, the transplant trends, you know, that to me is, says the whole story. You know, you can't transplant, you know, if a patient, you know, if, if a person decides they're going to donate their liver after they pass away um, and become an organ donor, which I think is one of the most special gifts you can do, uh, if they have fatty liver, you can't donate that organ because the organ doesn't work as well right. and there's a risk that it's not going to have function in the person receiving it. And so we're running into, we're going to run into that problem as well. So we, we really do. We yeah. have a, we have a big problem on our hands. No French fries for me tonight. Mm -mm. I'm sorry. Nope. It's just not going to happen. So you've got, currently have two daughters. Uh -huh. um, let's just say that 
one or both decides to follow in your footsteps, daddy's footsteps, and becomes a physician, maybe even a hepatologist. Mm -hmm. Will they see hep C, hepatitis C? That's a great question. Uh, you know, I would have told you before that they wouldn't. Um, but what, unfortunately, what we're seeing is, you know, we see obviously the common one and the, the, the vast majority of people that we see that have hep C are the baby boom generation born mm -hmm. between 1945 and 1965. So regardless of your risk factors, if you're born between those ages, you should be tested. I mean, you really should. Um, but if, you know, now we're also, while we're curing this, you're seeing a lot of young people and unfortunately in the, I mean, this is very, you can go online and read about it, the, you know, issues with narcotics and IV mm -hmm. drug use and heroin and you know a lot of stuff kind of coming back and yeah. people are unfortunately are getting into this and we're seeing this in you know 20 and 30 year olds um and so you know there's a lot of reasons as to why this could be and i'm not very well versed on a lot of it but we're seeing it yeah the question is is that population going to grow because if that population grows then the answer is going to be you know my daughter would take care of that yeah. You know, we may see would, waves of it. You may. Mm -hmm. um, the, you know, the key thing I think is obviously right now getting people plugged in, which we're doing a great job of here, uh, going into communities that don't otherwise have care, getting them linked. Um, there, there's a lot of in, a lot of really neat programs within uh, Alabama trying to help with that. And uh, but no, they they so very short of a it. short of a vaccine, they'll probably they be there may because of behavior. Uh, it leads to to infection. There I don't may, think there, there may be waves of. Yeah, you're gonna see waves of it. I don't yeah. think you're gonna see because the the, the the you know that was one of the major causes of transplant. You know, even five years mm -hmm. ago, right? If not the number one cause. And so right now it, it's on the downslope big time. And so we're seeing less and less and less of that. So. Cool. So um, I know a lot of us, myself included, look to improve health. Maybe by a vitamin nutritional supplements, maybe something over the counter. I take vitamin C. I'm not convinced it, it's gonna keep me from getting a cold this fall, but I take it anyway. So people ask me all the time, you know, what can I take? What might help my liver? You know, I think that I'm, I'm not drinking, I'm watching out for Tylenol. And is there anything I can take that'll help my liver? Do you have any thoughts about that? Or is that just yeah. like, what do you think? Well. I'll first say there's nothing out there. You'll see there's tons of stuff. I mean, you'll see these liver cleansing things. People yeah. ask me about that all the time. Um, there's just there's just tons of stuff, and mm -hmm. the answer is no. Um, there there is nothing that is going to kind of boost the immunity or boost the function of the liver and make it better. And in fact, one of the things that I, one of the etiologies I didn't mention earlier in the show was was what we call DILI, D-I-L-I, or drug induced mm -hmm. liver injury. And there's a lot of neat stuff out there on this. Um, there's a guy at the University of Michigan, Bob Fantana, um, who I've heard him speak multiple times. Um, and he has a couple network, the Dylan Network, um, mm -hmm. that really looks at this. And there's a website, and I encourage a lot of people um, that, because it's, it's uh, government run uh, uh, liver talks. And the physicians can go on there, they can put the drug in, and it's all alphabetized. and. Um, in the generic form and boom you can look at it and get a lot of good information as to is this drug yeah. what the potential is and what it does and so you know a lot of these herbals we are seeing this mm -hmm. more and more and more we're seeing people take certain medications that are either over the counter or herbals or whatever what what have you causing um, drug induced liver injury and we know that that while most people most people get better that sometimes it leads to, and I've seen a couple cases in my training of people going on to need a liver transplant due to a supplement. And so I just tell people, you can't. A lot of these things aren't FDA approved. So you don't know how much you're taking, what you're taking, is it really what they say on this right. bottle and by and how much and all that kind of stuff. So I think there's the regulation, you know, is, yeah. is a big issue. Okay. So I, I tell people, no, don't yeah. do it. Gotcha, good, good advice. Final question, can you see your house from here? I can see the street. Pretty where close. Walk. Yeah, I can walk here. Yeah, it's kind of nice. My wife's work is in walking distance. My kids' school is in I walking like distance. My work is in walking distance. The grocery store is in walking distance. The Piggly Wiggly. Piggly Wiggly, right here. Cool. So it's close. All right. Well, listen. We really appreciate it, Dr. Fedig, uh, joining us for a really a kind of a patient-centered discussion about liver disease. Again, send us any questions you have. I'm happy to kind of let Dr. Fedig look at those and, and respond. 
Um, and we appreciate you joining us for the inaugural episode of the GI Show uh, here from BGA Studios and in the shadow of Vulcan.